Well hello minders. Welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor. Today we're going to be painting some wildflowers, specifically uh, masking and showing you how to mask for wildflowers. Now I've showed this technique before, but I've never shown it over colored paper. In other words, where you lay down a wash first, then mask, then lift it. But these wildflowers here, uh, actually a lot of this has gone to seed. Uh, they were profuse uh, a few days ago or a couple weeks ago and I just didn't get around to taking a picture. But I have a good enough idea from this photo of how I want at least the grass structure and the ground to look. Uh, I think it's yarrow. I have these fields everywhere of yarrow growing. And I just was inspired to do a painting of it. And as I mentioned, I've shown this technique a couple other ways. I think on a blooming tree, on a field of grass. But I wanted to show where you actually tone the paper before you mask. And I'm going to start out by doing a thumbnail. Just to kind of get my compositional structure down. This is a Carandosh Technolo Water Soluble Graphite 3B. I like doing thumbnails monochromatically and in water soluble graphite. I think it's a good medium for doing quick little thumbnails. So I am doing a little bit of a value study, but really more just to kind of show where I want my composition to be. There's going to be a lot of broad washes and sort of suggestive ground texture, that sort of thing. So it's good to have a little bit of a compositional map. And this is different than my photo. I'm using the photo for structure clues, value clues, texture and detail clues, that sort of thing. But I'm sort of making up the composition. Today I'm going to use Stonehenge Aqua. Great paper. This is their heavy block, a 300 pound block. And this is what I'm going to be painting on. I've already got it taped off, as you can see. Cold press, and you can get an idea here as I hold it in the light what the texture looks like. So a bit of a texture. Pretty typical of a cold press paper. And I thought what I would do rather than draw in graphite, kind of draw out, lightly draw out my scene, I thought what I would do is draw it out in a sort of a olive green watercolor pencil and then kind of tone that pencil into some washes. Uh, I, I have no intent for this watercolor pencil to do anything really for the color or the painting. It's just uh, to help map out my paper and know where it's going to go. And the watercolor pencil I'm using because when I paint over that most of this is just going to completely disappear. You'll never see it. It would be fine if I wanted to do it in graphite. I could do that. But this is another technique I use from time to time. And it just tells me where to start painting. And I'm going to start the sky by just pre-wetting the background. Getting a nice area. The sky really just needs to be very, very simple. Um, it's going to be minimal in this scene. But I do think I want a few little white fluffy cloud areas. So I'm just washing in a diffuse mixture or a mixture that will diffuse, cerulean blue and a little bit of Payne's Gray. Get that all nice and spread out and just probably the simplest, easiest way to make clouds and that's just blotting with a tissue. Makes those nice sort of white fluffy clouds. And again, I don't want this to be distracting or a lot. I just want a little bit of a hint at the sky. And I want to make sure my bottom edge is sort of faded out to nothing. So now we're going to start in with the, the distant tree line, the background. And when you do layers of landscape, in other words, background, middle ground, foreground, you've got to pay attention to your edges. What do you want those edges to be like? Because it's really difficult to change them later in watercolor. So I'm... On a tree line like this, I'm paying attention to my top edge and my bottom edge. Because the bottom edge and what's below it is going to be much dark, much lighter, excuse me. So I'm keeping sort of a irregular, raggedy edge there that I think will, will look good with the paint. And I want some variation in the tree values that are in this background tree line. So I'm adding some dark tones as the uh, 
paint spreads less and I'm lifting right now you can see me lifting some highlights just to make those trees look like there's several you know it's a stand of trees in the distance there got mixes of phthalo blue Prussian blue Payne's gray maybe a little bit of olive green thrown in here and there now from here on down for the first pass I'm gonna stay very light and probably gonna cover the whole area because as I mentioned I want to be able to mask out for those wildflowers so I'm not gonna put down any deeper values just enough maybe to tell myself where the ground structure is, you know, where the ground planes are, where the clumps of grass are going to be, and to give myself a, a area to put masking fluid over. And I'm varying the mixture here. I've got some nickel quinacridone gold. I've got a little bit of orange iron oxide, a little bit of uh, azo green, nickel azo yellow. Just a very light but highly tinted scene or or a paint with a high tinting strength maybe a little a few touches of sap green here and there and you can see me just dabbing in and hinting at where the base of some of these uh, wildflower clumps will be so all very loose and washy And this is still sort of adhering to my composition and building out that structure a little bit. Here I'm adding some more orange iron oxide. I'm just trying to build an edge or two, or at least let my know where the, let myself know where those edges will be as I bring the values down. It's all very soft, but I'm still hinting at some of the structure in the, the weeds and the wildflowers. Time to mask. And so this is what I'm doing. And this mask needs to be replaced. It's kind of gloppy, but it worked okay. This is my ugly brush. And I'm using Pebeo drawing gum. My ugly brush was designed to sort of bounce around, almost like a more controlled spatter. And that works. To a certain extent but I very quickly found out I wanted to a little more control in placing the dots it's nice to be able to get a random texture so it works in that respect but I needed to more precisely place some of these clusters you see that big glob in the center that was a mistake whenever I get a big glob like that of masking fluid where it doesn't belong I let it dry because if you do that, you can lift it up and redo it if you need to. But since um, I'm going to paint over these anyway. Now this is what you can use. This is a, actually a burnishing tool. But you can use it as a masking tool. So I'm using that to dot in some even smaller dots. Another thing that I could have done would be to, to spatter like with a toothbrush or with another brush. But because I didn't want spatter everywhere, I didn't do that. Now I'm just stroking in what's going to be some highlight suggestions of the stalks of these wildflowers. I don't need many, just a few that will stand out. And for that I'm using uh, one of the very large hunt speedball nibs. Um, it's one that will spread quite a bit. You kind of need one that will spread a lot to get this fluid flowing. And the masking's all done and dry, so I'm going to paint in this one tree that uh, breaks the plane or the horizon. And I made a mistake in not painting around the area where I was going to do that tree. I knew where I wanted to put it, and I shouldn't have just carried that background tree line right through there. You can see it shows through. But I think I can fix it. I'll add some really dark washes. This tree is very dark, and I can disguise it, I think. Notice how the tree is warmer, warmer greens, more yellow greens, and how I kept the distant tree line a little bluer, just to push it back. I'm lifting now, after I've done the wet and wet washes, I'm just lifting to 
sculpt a few highlights in there. Here you can see what I was talking about. I'm sort of trying to disguise that distant tree line that showed through. You can go darker with watercolor, but it's much more difficult to go lighter. Now I'm going to start building all the value and weed wildflower structure behind those masks, those little dot pattern of masking. And they will form this whole stand of wildflowers. And I'm keeping in mind the way these grasses flow. This is where my photo reference comes in handy because it shows the the way they're leaning. It shows you know how much you can see of the stalks of these uh, wildflowers. And while I don't want to paint in every blade, I just want enough motion and uh, texture suggestion. To really get across you know the feeling that it's a clump of wildflowers so that's what I'm doing I'm trying different things and I'll do this a lot I'll try different brushes just to see what will happen with the randomization of the texture at this point I can be fairly loose as long as I'm keeping that that thrust that textural direction in mind And some of these colors will meld together and flow together, and some of them won't. As the colors do start to flow together, then I can sort of dot in some deep pops of contrast, you know, to suggest where there are layers of these uh, wildflower clumps. And this is a very important part here, where you start describing the ground plane. I see this a lot in uh, landscape painters, beginner landscape painters, is they don't give things like trees and clumps of grass a base, a solid base to sit on. They don't spend enough time sort of defining that ground plane. So you need to do that in a convincing way. And, you know, also adding these edges, you can see me sort of creating more layers with, with the dark contrast just gives the whole thing dimension it pulls your eye through the piece instead of making it look like a cutout and when you get to the base of all these wildflowers again you know you have to keep in mind that there is a ground plane there just want to balance out the composition here down in this corner few more of the same grasses and wildflowers. Good bit of um, simplification takes place and you really have to do that in watercolor landscape. Elements in the photo, just way too many, too busy, too chaotic, but they give me enough of an idea of how the contrast and the texture uh, needs to sort of look, the impression it needs to leave. And we're going to lift this mask. This is one way to do it. A lot of artists do it this way with their finger. I probably should have kept doing it this way. Turns out that, that Stonehenge Aqua does not take masks very well. Uh, it tore, especially that big glob in the middle. And when you use a rubber cement pickup like this, this is another way to lift masks. It's kind of an aggressive way. And it tore, it tore the paper in places. You could see where, right there in the center. There's, what I'm pointing to, there's no color. It literally lifted off, tore off some of the paper. And it did it to a lesser degree in other areas. So not as much of the color came through. And it's probably because of the paper was so soft. 
Now I get this question all the time. I get people who who comment on my channel. You know they're discouraged. The the mask doesn't work. You have got to test your mask. If you do a painting where you use masking fluid, you've got to know that you're using a paper that does really well with masking fluid. And just a, a feel there at the end will very easily tell you if there's any left on the paper. So I should have tested it. I didn't take my own advice. I should have tested the paper. That delicate surface painter's tape that's creating a border, that also tore the paper. And I was very surprised at that. So less impressed with Stonehenge. I really like Stonehenge Aqua for painting, but didn't realize how fragile it was to taping and masking. Not great. Not great at all. Generally when you do stuff like masking, you want to make sure of your supplies. You want to test them. Had I been doing a finished piece, like a commission or something I knew was going to be framed, I would use what to me would have been the most dependable supplies and I know that I never have a problem taping and masking on arches so that's what I should have been using. But uh, in the end um, it's a good paper Stonehenge Aqua and even where it tore it painted over without you know noticeable um, wicking and troublesome spots. All I've been doing is painting in some more color uh, for those wildflowers. Mixes of Indian yellow, uh, nickel quinacridone gold, a little bit of azo orange even where I wanted the yellow to vary and become more orange. And I'm opening up some of those areas. There, there was too much masking. I would rather have too much masking than too little because I can paint it back to be darker. And I can open it up and add little areas like I'm doing now. Create little clumps of these flower heads. One thing you don't want to do in a situation like this with wildflowers that have, have it all looked evenly spaced out. Like polka dots. You want flowers to clump together in natural bundles like they would in the wild. So that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to just separate some of these areas without spacing them out too evenly. And we're getting near the end here. I haven't shown all of the work I've done on the ground, but I've done more work just to add uh, some texture and shadowing to the ground features. Just to give all that something to sit on. Here's the finished piece. This is even after quite a few more touches and fiddling and tweaking. I'm pretty happy with that. Thanks everybody. Appreciate you tuning in. Get out your mask. Give it a try. Make sure you test it on your paper. We'll see everybody in the next video. Bye-bye.